Hey everybody, thank you for joining today. My name is Jonathan Johnson and we are going to be walking through a project that took most of the year of 2020 for me that includes RPC. But before we get into that, I would like to introduce myself a little bit more. So I'm an associate consultant here at SpectreOps on the detection engineering team. I like to create and contribute to many open source projects. Uh, my GitHub can be found along with blog and Twitter there in those links. And one thing I want to point out is I'm never an expert, but always a student. So I'm always trying to learn from everyone around me. So before I get started in this talk, I would like to give some acknowledgments to some people in the community and some amazing people that I work with as well. Um, this research wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for Jared Atkinson and Lee Christensen. They not only served as sanity checks for me during this research time, but also helped answer tons of questions that I had. If you've never talked to any of those guys, they're some of the most intelligent people I've ever talked to. Um, along with some research from the following people, Matt Graber, Matt Hand, James Forshaw, also some of the most intelligent people I've ever talked to, read their work. Um, and if any of you watched this talk, I just want to say thank you for your previous work. This wouldn't have been possible without you guys. So the content's going to be as follows, right? We're going to initially talk about the journey, how I got to looking into RPC. I feel like this um, process really holds a lot of um, importance, especially when it comes to other technologies and when people want to start to research other technologies as well. Um, we're going to talk about RPC, all the different components that lie inside of it, why they're important, um, and the part that they play in our everyday experience inside of Windows components. Um, as long as how can we leverage this telemetry that correlates with RPC, some of the research that I found, some of the telemetry I found, and then how to take that research telemetry and scale it. So how did this all begin? Well, um, Jared Atkinson is the technical um, director lead here at SpectreOps and the detection engineering team. And he introduced the concept in 2020 called capability abstraction. This, um, this methodology is meant to extract different technology layers by which um, a specific task can be performed. Um, so it was meant to break down the different components by way an attacker can perform a specific malicious attack. Um, and in doing so, it helps identify pivot points for defenders um, when it comes to telemetry and the things that we want to see in our environment. And maybe if we identify something that we currently don't have telemetry for, we can either create the tooling to see that telemetry, or if tooling comes out in the future, we have notes and identification of the telemetry we can see from um, that new tooling. Um, the abstraction typically comes in a map format. And whenever I, whenever Jared first came out with this concept, my first thought was, I want to dive deep into this methodology. I want to figure out how to utilize it um, and really become an expert in this. So I utilized um, DC Sync. DC Sync is typically my um, go-to um, research whenever it comes to new technologies that it's like to use as a use case quite often. Um, so in doing so, I went through the abstraction process and this isn't, I'm not going to break down the abstraction process. Um, Jared has a great blog out on that. I mean, I believe some of the other people from the team have either abstraction maps out there or different processes that you can use. But what I want to show here is in this abstraction map, when I started creating it, I started to identify there was a lot of different components um, to Windows I just didn't really understand. Um, if I'm going to go into a TLDR of DC Sync and a couple of different slides in the future, but if you're not aware of it, it's a way for an attacker to um, capture credentials from a user utilizing the DRS replication service, which is an RPC protocol. Um, and there's been a lot of great blogs, a lot of great talks out on DC Sync. Um, but I feel like there was a lot of um, things just glossed over and things that I maybe I just didn't understand, maybe it was just me. So I wanted to start to identify it. So when going through this abstraction map, there are specifically these things that I didn't really understand was um, an RPC protocol that made sense. It sounded like a service to me. RPC interface. I wasn't really for. I wasn't really sure what that meant. Um, typically, when I think of technologies, this isn't always the case. But I like to think one to one. So, how did an RPC interface, um, DRS UAPI, and that that uh, that GUID right there, 
if that's a one-on-one, then how did this DLL come into play? I wasn't really sure about that. Also, what were methods? Um, this looks like a function to me, but I wasn't quite sure um, how in depth or what it meant. And then when it came to the subtraction, what did replication of the NC schema mean when I was researching it and running tests? Did I even need that section or was that kind of um, inherently given in something before? Um, so I had to start identifying things I didn't know. Um, in doing so, I started to ask myself different questions. So that was things like when the network connection was made, what processes made those connections right between two remote hosts? Um, how were the credentials being brought back to the client? Outside of network traffic, is there any visibility into RPC? And what did RPC do exactly? So how can I really look for data or telemetry when I didn't understand the technology itself? And that brings us to what RPC is. So the, that was kind of my first step was I wanted to, before I can really start to look into telemetry, looking into data, I need to understand what RPC did and what it was and how I interacted with it, how Windows components interacted with it and how common it was inside of the, or on the system really. Um, so to do that, I just started to do a lot of research and break down the different components. So a little bit about RPC, if you're not familiar, it's a technology used for distributed client and server communications between programs, and it allows applications to send signals to each other to perform an operation. Um, RPC can be seen in everyday Windows environments for everyday procedures, um, ranging from authentication, direct replication, service creation, scheduled tasks, WMI, um, and et cetera. Um, so just keep in mind that whenever I walk through these RPC components, um, there are going to be, um, RPC can be used many different ways, but I'm going to be focusing on specifically the Microsoft implementation and it's supporting development tools, not any low level protocol implementation details. So things that you might see in like Impacket, NT Object Manager, and I'll go into those two a little bit in the future. Um, but I'm not going to be focusing on those. Let's keep that in mind. So here we're going to start breaking down the different components. So an RPC protocol um, is going to basically be a service. So Microsoft supports many service-based protocols by default on Windows. These services can be thought of as protocols. So think of like direct replication, um, service control manager, the printer system, things like that. RPC is going to happen between client and servers. So um, typically all the code needed to interact with the Microsoft supported RPC protocol is already pre-compiled and stored within the server or RPC server. And keep in mind, this is done so that developers did not have to write the code needed to interact with the Microsoft RPC interfaces without needing to implement the calls at a protocol level. Um, these protocols can be stored in XE, SIS, and DLL binaries. Um, and just one thing I want to know is these binaries themselves are not actually the server or the quote unquote client. These applications just hold the code or the RPC server and client code that get exposed to the RPC runtime. What is the RPC interface? Well, that is um, basically think of this as a bridge between um, a client and a server. So when using Microsoft development tools and RPC interface, is defined by something known as the Microsoft Interface Definition Language, or MIDL. Typically, this is stored as an IDL file. These files include um, protocols, the interface is associated with, the methods, and the parameters that interact with that interface. Each interface is tied to a universally unique identifier, and that is 128 bits or 16 bytes. This is an example of what this will look like in the IDL file. So here we can see the UUID. Um, we can see the interface name. So in this specific example, it is test. And you can see the methods that are supported by this interface. Um, and that is going to be start notepad and start CMD. And these are going to be internal functions that were created for the specific use case. An RPC client call um, can it can be 
interacted it, it, RPC interface can be interacted many different ways. Um, one of which is um, a Win32 API can be called that will implement an RPC interface. Um, typically, this can be seen in most native Windows binaries. Um, and this is going to save devs from having to implement the IDL or RPC client themselves since it was done by someone previously before. An RPC client contains the necessary IDL code baked in so that it can talk to the RPC server. Um, you can see this very commonly within Mimikatz code. And then as well as an RPC client will talk to the RPC server directly by implementing the RPC over TCP IP or RPC over namepipe protocols and will not interface with the client's OS RPC runtime. Um, this can be typically seen within mpacket where all the client side components need to successfully communicate to the RPC server are handcrafted. This will include handcrafting the client stub for serialization. We'll get into serialization here in a little bit. Um, code needed to fit the NDR, which stands for Network um, da Data Representation Format. RPC method code, RPC handle binding, and et cetera. All that's already caked into that client side. RPC methods. Methods are just functions that the RPC server exposes to perform a specific behavior. Each RPC method is identified by an operation number or known as an opnum. You can see this commonly inside of Microsoft documentation for Microsoft supported RPC protocols. Um, the interface will have opnums um, specifically for them and I'll show a couple of those here in a moment. Um, when these methods are called, they accept parameters and arguments um, then they perform the task and then return data results back to the client. Opnums are given to a method based on where they are defined inside of the server code. So for example, um, in my, I had a use case where I just created my own client and server RPC um, and interface code um, because I wanted to learn more about it and just kind of see what all entailed when I'm utilizing the MIDL. So Here's an example of different two different methods here. Um, keep in mind, I'm not actually passing any parameters in through these, um, but here's an example where start notepad would be opnum zero and start note start cmd excuse me would be opnum number one. So client and server stubs um, these are used to serialize and deserialize the parameters are being passed to the method. The interface with the Windows RPC runtime to send and receive data over a transport. When the client wants to use a method, it will pass the parameters needed for that method to perform the specific task. The parameters need to be transported to the server application before the transport of these parameters can actually happen. The client must serialize the parameters the server will deserialize or unpack the parameters before feeding it to the exposed method function that is being invoked. So here's an example of my code for the um, stub. Um, this image is going to show an example of what the client stub may look like. However, no, again, these um, there's no parameters being passed to these methods. So it might look different for any code that does do that. So the NDR engine um, is responsible for marshalling of DCOM and RPC components. Um, once the client sub serializes the method's parameters, the data must get to the server stub somehow. Um, this transportation is actually done through the runtime, which is driven by the NDR engine. The RPC runtime just holds the operation system's core RPC components, so endpoint in mapper, and I'll be getting into that here in a moment. And it's responsible for the transportation of the serialized parameters from the client stub to the server stub. And all this code can actually be found inside of the RPC RT4.dll file. It's actually, if you've never dug into that before, it's actually kind of cool to um, dig into RPC code that is provided by Microsoft via like Ida or Girda. Um, it was, that was actually a lot of fun for me to look at. Endpoint mapper. So this is a service that is located on every windows host. Um, and it's typically seen as EP mapper. Um, I've never seen it called anything else. 
um, and it maintains the database of endpoints that clients use to map an interface to endpoints. At runtime, this service is started and acts as a director to map client and server communication. Um, so whenever, um, I'll show this here in a moment, but whenever a client is passed through the NDR engine um, and the runtime is transporting the serialized data from the client, it'll want to map to whatever the server is and that mapping is done by the endpoint mapper. The name service database or the locator allows clients to applications use logical names instead of specific network address and protocol sequences. I personally have never seen this. Um, it's just, this was taken directly from Microsoft documentation basically. Um, and Microsoft actually mentioned in their documentation that they have a specific article that says that it isn't supported past Windows Vista. So no, you might not ever see it unless you have a super outdated version of Windows. So what is an endpoint? I've been saying endpoint, endpoint mapper quite a bit. Um, this is going to be the TCP IP port um, name pipe that the client will use to communicate with the server. And the server will listen on this endpoint and wait for the client to initialize the communication. Um, this happens, typically the client will reach, or the server will be exposed. And then um, being exposed, it'll wait for that communication. The client will want to communicate. The endpoint mapper points it to the server that then communicate. Um, there, but keep in mind, there's two types of endpoints. So there's static, and this is when an RPC protocol will communicate over the same port or name pipe every time consistently. And there's also dynamic, and this is used when a range of ports are utilized or if the protocol allows connection over TCP IP or a name, or a name pipe. An example of this code can be seen here whenever I implemented my own interface. I specified that I wanted the client and the server to connect over a name pipe, specifically a name pipe called JSecurity 101. Now, I know that there were a lot of components in this RPC process, so I went ahead and made a mapping video to walk through it all, and I will walk everyone through the steps while this video is playing. So what's first going to happen is the application that holds the RPC server is going to get loaded, and then the RPC server code is going to expose to the RPC runtime. The client is going to implement the RPC interface and then pass the parameters to the method that it wants to invoke. The parameters are serialized via the client stub in NDR format. And then the runtime is going to transport that serialized data, but the NDR engine is going to be what's driving the runtime during this time. At this time as well, the endpoint mapper is going to map to the specified endpoint that was specified in the interface. The remote machine is going to accept the incoming communication and a bind is going to be created. At that time, um, the server stub will deserialize the parameters. And then the parameters are going to get passed to the method. And then that method is going to be is going to get invoked. Once that method is invoked, if there's any return data, that data will return at that time through the runtime, and then the, the binding is freed. So within this next section, I'm going to be talking about how I identified RPC telemetry and then how I wound up leveraging it from a data in engineering perspective. So the first thing I wanted to do was identify the different ways an attacker could interact with an interface. And we went ahead and figured this out whenever we looked at the RPC interface definition. But to recap on that, an attacker can um, interact with the interface either by um, a Win32 API, it can also um, have the necessary IDL code baked into the client, uh, Mimikatz does this, as well as it can directly communicate with the RPC server um, via the TCP IP or over a name pipe, Impacket does this, and that's whenever the, serializ the client stub serialization is all handcrafted. When identifying this, I identified that Although there was many ways to interact with the interface, there was something that the attacker can not control. And that is the server code itself. It cannot, they cannot change the server code, nor could they um, change where the server code was stored. Now, keep in mind, this is specific to Microsoft supported protocols. And what's nice about this is if we can start to map these server codes to um, malicious techniques, 
then that helps us as detection engineers identify places that we know attackers have to interact with or applications that we know an attacker has to interact with. Um, and that could become a nice pivot point for us. Matt Nelson actually um, documents these RPC servers for us inside of a GitHub GIST. And whenever we can um, identify things that an attacker cannot control, that becomes a pivot point for us as detection engineers, which ultimately is ideal. Now, I'm going to be utilizing DC Sync as my UK use case, as I mentioned before. And a lot of this information is very well known and out there in many blogs and has been known for a long time. So this is nothing groundbreaking. I just wanted to go ahead and give a TLDR on this specific technique. So DC Sync is used to capture credentials um, by impersonating domain controller. This is done by the Directory Replication Service RPC protocol that's supported by Microsoft. And the interface to do this is the DRS UAPI. Um, typically, the extended rights, um, actually always the extended rights needed to uh, implement and interact with this interface are the DS replication get changes all and the DS replication get changes. Those GUIDs are attached below. And these extended rights are default in the domain admin, enterprise admin, DC computer accounts. Um, but it doesn't always have to be the case. A user can obtain those extended rights um, pretty easily. Um, whenever these extended rights are um, acquired, um, that gives them access to the domain DNS class, um, and that allows them to perform replication to the NC replica within AD, Active Directory, um, and this is achieved by utilizing the method DRS get NC changes. The process typically is as follows. An attacker can and will obtain user with specified extended rights, targets a domain controller to replicate, requests the replication via the method DRS get NC changes, obtains AD secrets. Again, many people have known this for a long time and here are a couple links to some blogs that hold um, information about this technique pretty in depth. So the first thing that I wanted to do um, was take my research and start to apply it to this specific technique. So the first thing I wanna do is um, identify the UUID for the interface. And this was given to us by Microsoft documentation, um, which was nice now keep in mind through this process not everything is given to us through microsoft documentation so i had to use multiple other tools and those are going to be nt object manager procmon etw wireshark wireshark etc the next thing i want to do was identify the server code and how i did that was use nt object manager by taking the interface id and then looking for the um, file path that contain that interface ID. Um, thank you to James Forshaw for having this available. Um, and during this, I identified that this interface and the server code is stored inside of ntdsai.ell. The next thing I wanna do was identify the endpoint. So what, how are they going to connect the client and server? Well, inside of Microsoft documentation, it showed that RPC over TCP, meaning that a port was going to be used for the specific communication. And it also mentioned that a dynamic endpoints were utilized as well, meaning the port is going to change over time. So for me as a detection engineer, I deemed that I cannot specify a specific port when looking for a detection because that port can change. The next thing I want to do was method identification. So I already knew that the DR DRS get NC changes method was used but I wanted to identify any other methods that are possibly there and then also what that looked like on a server side. So I utilize ETW um, to do this. If you're not familiar with ETW, that stands for Event Tracing in Windows. And I actually learned this from Matt Graber. So Matt Graber, if you watch this, thank you for showing me this. So in here I um, specified, I did a event trace and then I performed the attack, and then afterwards I was able to see the following information from the capture. Um, in this capture, um, I saw the opnum, so the opnum is gonna directly correlate with the method, um, which if you go to Microsoft documentation, it will show that the DRS get and see changes um, matches that opnum. That's pretty cool to see, and um, I was curious if that could be leveraged in the future. The next thing I did was did a Wireshark capture. This was nice because I already identified things I can see on the host, but I was curious um, what Wireshark over the network looked like. 
And as I did this, I identified that I could see the TCP endpoint, I could see the interface, and I could see the opnum or the method. This was nice, um, but I was also curious if there was anything I was missing from the host side. Now, I actually utilized Procmon for this, and this was actually really fun to do. So from the server side, you can see that Mimikatz is doing a TCP connection, and then on the client, that LSAS is accepting that. Now, we can see that the port here matches the test along the way from Wireshark and from the ETW capture. But there's some things I was kind of curious about. We can see this replication, NTS DIT, which makes sense um, because it has to read from NTS DIT, um, which if you're not familiar, that is the database for Active Directory. So it's pulling the credentials there. Um, and then what I was curious about was why LSAS was there because I've already identified that ntdsai.dll was actually the server. So after doing some digging, I saw that um, with even ID7 inside of Sysmon, um, that ntdsai.dll was loaded into LSAS. Um, and this was actually a trick that um, Matt Hand showed me. So I then went to see when the boot up time was and correlated that with the time that the image load was. And sure enough, this happened at boot where LSAS loaded ntdsai.dll on domain controllers. So that was really cool to see. So at that point, LSAS accepting that connection made complete sense. Now, I want to take this research telemetry and make it scalable. So converting my research data into telemetry um, can be relatively easy depending on the data sensors within the environment. Um, and again, taking um, the Wireshark data capture um, to um, Zeek was relatively easy. Um, so on the left here, you can see this is actually Zeek data. Um, but what I was curious about was host data from Procmon ETW. Was there anything there? And at first, I, whenever I Googled um, RPC event data inside of Microsoft, there was an event called 5712 RPC was attempted, but it doesn't actively collect. And it says something along the lines where it doesn't appear any events um, actually appear which was curious and upon testing that was true. But one thing I started to see when, at least from the, on the service side when performing this attack, I saw that every time the 4662 happened, if you're not familiar with DC Sync or 4662, 4662 is utilized for basically every DC Sync detection. Um, you can see the extended writes in there, you can see the user. Um, etc. So um, that's typically the main um, pivot point for DC Sync. But one thing I was noticing was this 5156 happening quite often. Um, and in doing so, here's an example of the 4662. And again, you can see the account name that requested um, the replication. You can see the object, the domain DNS class. Um, and you can also see the extended rights in the access mass, which is control access. So all this aligns perfectly with how an attacker would typically interact with the DRS RPC protocol maliciously, because typically this should only happen from other domain controllers. Um, but what I was seeing was this 5156. Now keep in mind, these port numbers might be a little bit different because this, these screenshots actually came from a different test. Um, but I was seeing an inbound connection to LSAS over the port um, that was actually connecting that correlated specifically with Procmon. Um, and that was particularly interesting. So I went to the client side and I was like, oh, I wonder if I can see anything going outbound. And sure enough, I was able to see that Mimikouts had an outbound connection, the same port, um, same ports to the same IPs. And that was particularly interesting to me because in my head, that clicked. That kind of correlated with that ETW and Procmon information that we had. The reality, though, is I didn't know anything about the Windows filtering platform. Um, but so I decided to kind of dive into that. Now, keep in mind, um, as I go through this, a lot of the same information can be with Sysmon even ID3 um, or any other EDR product that allows network connection. The only difference is like you don't get to see the direction outbound or inbound with Sysmon.
unfortunately. So when looking at the Windows filtering platform, I saw here, I clicked on the link, I started to do a little bit of research, and I found this architecture map, which was pretty cool. Thank you, Microsoft, for having this. Um, and inside of it, there was RPC everywhere. So all of this was starting to make sense because I saw the RPC server application, which is where the server code would be stored. I saw the RPC runtime. I saw the RPC interface. And I was like, oh, well, this directly correlates with RPC. So the next question I had was, does this data correlate with Zeek at all? Because if it does correlate with Zeek or if there's any of the same information, then this would be a good event to use for a join during an analytic. So during this, I saw that sure enough, um, there was plenty of network packet data I could correlate with Zeek. Um, I could see and correlate specifically how this 5156 interacted or correlated with the RPC server. And I could start to specify the inbound and outbound, which helped me separate um, server and client um, applications. Because the outbound will come from a client, the inbound will come from a server. So sure enough, I was able to utilize this inside of a, an analytic where I'm using the 4662, 4624, 5156, and Zeek as well. Um, I did do the same analytic, um, which is 5156 and Zeek. Got the same amount of events. Um, so it was really nice to see. Um, this is all on the SpectreOps GitHub and the whole notebook. This is utilizing Jupyter Notebooks and Splunk. Um, the whole notebook is actually up on the SpectreOps GitHub under the IPC research project. So here we can see the endpoint, which is the DRS UAPI that came from Zeek. The operation, DRS, get and see changes. I could see the port, the destination address, the application name. So the application name would be the server application, um, which this was all really cool to see. So after this, I wanted to answer some of the own knowns that I went ahead and identified. Um, and during this, um, this was really fun for me because it really showed that the research process that I had um, answered the original questions that I might have had. And I didn't go too off track during this. So um, I answered what RPC did exactly. Um, also, what network connections were made and how they were made. Um, how were the credentials being brought back to the client, um, specifically the method and the interface, and then if there was any host-based data that we could utilize for telemetry. Um, and this was really cool to see. Now, one thing I want to point out back at this slide here, you can see with the analytic that the application name for the server was um, specified, and um, you can see that inside the analytic for the server code. You can actually... Um, do somewhat of the same analytic where you um, specify the outbound information to actually find the the RPC client. And I believe I did this inside of the SpectreOps GitHub um, when I uploaded that notebook. You can actually see the RPC client, um, the RPC client um, application. Lastly, here is um, the final product of the abstraction for DC Sync. I mean, as you can see, it's a lot more robust and it's a lot more detailed um, and there's a lot more context surrounding the different components. And this is ultimately the goal of the abstraction is to give as much context detail to the co specific components as possible as to how an attacker can um, implement the attack or leverage the attack they are trying to do. Lastly, I would like to talk about the purpose of this talk, of this research, um, and why I thought it was important to kind of share. Um, the purpose was to show a methodology that can be used across many technologies to uncover their meanings, to provide insight to detection engineers as to any data that can be leveraged pertaining that technology. You know, this goes far beyond RPC. This goes to really any technology that is out there because um, I think oftentimes it is easy for us as detection engineers to stop after a certain threshold and not dive any deeper into a specific technology, whether we think that is because the telemetry that we find cannot be scaled or we're not sure of the technology that's actually there. Um, that could actually be one of our biggest downfalls because once we identify um, that telemetry, we can start to piece together any events that we didn't know about before and implement them and possibly 
um, use that data at scale. Now, speaking of scaling data, um, scaling data does not equal collecting all the logs. So when I mean collecting 5156 at scale, yes. Can it be used for detections in large organizations? Absolutely. Um, you know, even if you're not using 5156, you could utilize another network event from an EDR that collects the same information. But again, keep in mind, it's going to be noisy. That is okay. Um, you want to make sure that you're collecting with a purpose. Um, don't just, there's no point in collecting um, every, let's say 5156 for every RPC server because we don't have a detection for every RPC server. There's no point in collecting that data if we're not actually utilizing that data or leveraging it in some way, shape, or form. Um, you don't have to collect it all. Identify what you don't so that you know what the risks are that are associated with it. But having something is better than nothing, especially when it's done correctly. Um, so, for example, we know that LSAS on domain controllers is the RPC server for the DR DRS UAPI interface. Well, that would be good to collect. You know, you don't have to collect all LSAS um, RPC servers on every host. We're just looking at the domain controller ones because we have it correlated with a specific attack right now. And once we accomplish that, we can start to build up our detection surrounding this technology or any other technology that we have trouble scaling data at. It's just taking things one step at a time and building it as time goes on. Here are the references I used. Um, my RPC white paper, research paper is at the very top, and there's um, different talks, um, different documentation that I used. Um, again, if you wanted a more detailed walkthrough of everything, I highly recommend going through my research paper. Um, and again, to everyone that's referenced in this um, section, thank you so much for your work previously. Thank you to everyone who has joined this talk today. I'm going to reference the chat room to um, answer any questions anyone might have. I hope everyone has a great day. And again, thank you so much for coming.